John 16, Jesus says to his disciples, I got to go. He says, the reason that I need to go is because I'm going to send someone, the Holy Spirit, to come and minister to your hearts. And that's... Before that time, the manifest presence of God could only be in one place. It could only be in one place. It was with Jesus. And Jesus understood that as he went to be with the Father, his Holy Spirit came and filled the believers, that then God's presence would be in each person. Now, we could get into the theological weeds of, is God um, omnipresent? Is he everywhere? Yes. His manifest presence, where it's tangible and you can feel it. It's powerful. The disciples in Matthew 24, they talk, they're asking him, okay, what's going to be the sign of your return? He's talking about him, him returning. And Jesus says a few things. He says, you know, be careful, don't be deceived. There's going to be false Christ, people who are going to say that they're me, but they're not. There's going to be also later on in verse 11, he says there's going to be false prophets. There's going to be all kinds of people that say that they're a part of me, that say that they're who I am, but they actually aren't. Don't be deceived. It's one of the hardest things deception is, is deceiving. Those that are deceived are in deception, don't know that they're deceived or are in deception. Have you ever had a moment when someone revealed something about you, who you are, your character, things that you do that you didn't know before? Those are hard times, aren't they? It's like mind blowing in some ways. It's like, oh, oh, I do. I do that. (laughs) That's no, I don't. I don't want to do that. But you do. Okay, well, now we got to process through it. Understanding, opening ourselves up to this place where <clears throat> God wants to, wants to move in a way that is different. But we have to be careful. Holy Spirit is a part of that journey to, um, to qualify you, to give you authority to move in your, in, in your community. How do we do what we do in church this morning? How do we do that out in the world? What does that look like? Most of us are like, well, we need, you know, call Pastor Dave or Dana and we'll, they'll come and help me. They'll do it. No, I need the, my, you know, I need certain, you know, <clears throat> that person, you know, Norma or Mark, they've got this anointing on them or who, whoever. It's like someone has a, a gifting in an area and they need to come with me. Guys, you have Holy Spirit in you. He's in you. What's your authority? What is your authority based on? Well, it's Christ's authority. And what was his based on? That's a great question. Second Corinthians 10. <clears throat> Paul says, By the humility and gentleness of Christ. Verse 3. That's his authority. By the humility and gentleness of Christ. Verse 3. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. And I've said this before, and <clears throat> if, if your hope is a political system or a political leader, if that's where your hope is, that's called a world system. And right there, Paul is saying, do not engage. Now, it doesn't mean you don't go vote. It doesn't mean you don't try and influence your world. It's not what I'm saying. But if your hope is in that, then it's very misplaced. Very misplaced. Is there an answer? We have this conflict in, in Russia and Ukraine. It's interesting. Um, and I would encourage you to go and do some research on other wars that we don't hear about because they're not politically or socially palatable for our media and our governments right now. There's other places that are going through hell. But you don't care about them because you're not told to care about them. 
We'll let that sink in. I'm going to leave that there. How do we war? On the contrary, we demolish these strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. The, every world system, every world leader <clears throat> sets themselves up as the answer. Right? It's like if I were to go and run for, um, oh, is it bugging you? <laughs> well, maybe I like doing that. Maybe I did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to put it over here. <laughs> oh, <Heather. clears throat> That's pretty good. I could see it from down there. I was standing up here. It's, it's not huge font, but it's 14. It's not. <clears throat> yeah, for an old man. We demolish these arguments that set themselves up against knowledge. Uh, ultimately, every authority that isn't submitted to God is set itself, has set itself up in opposition to him. The question is, is the authority that we have submitted ourselves to submitting itself to the Lord? There's so much tension in that. Like, you guys feel that? You're like, well, Dave, I've got all kinds of questions. I'm like, yeah, me too. What does that mean in this context or that context? What does it mean in my job and my work? What does it mean with my parents or, you know, uh, a different, you know, political systems or, you know, what does it mean? Yeah, there's tension there. But ultimately, where are we supposed to? The question is this. <clears throat> can we as believers, can we have an answer to the shaking in the world? Do we have an answer? Is there something there that is, that is greater than the world's very broken, very obviously corrupted systems? You know, we could talk about democracy and how What adjective should I use? Unprecedented it is in world history. Democracy is a pretty amazing thing that has never happened before in all of history. And we've had it for what, 200 years-ish, give or take? It's spread around the world. It's this great system of governance. But what are we seeing right now? All of man's systems all begin to fade. They all turn into love of money, love of power, love of control, and they eventually kind of devolve into chaos. Every single word, I think, and I could be wrong on this, someone could correct me, whatever. I think that world powers, major world powers in history have about 150 to 200 year cycle. Somewhere in there, I could be wrong on that, give or take. Someone could correct me on that. Democracy, if we look at it, not just our democracy or Western democracy, I guess that's what it, technically it is, but it's had about a 200-year run. It's been a good run. Freedom, you know, the people, the common people ruling, sort of, mostly, kind of. <laughs> Doesn't feel like it much lately. But that's part of the problem is that it's due. We're due for a new system. Now, it's like, holy smokes, Dave, like apocalyptic. What the heck are you talking about? What does this have to do? Why are you preaching this on Sunday morning? <clears throat> we have to understand and be aware of our true state of our world. We can't, we can't put our heads in the sand. So many times it's like, wow, we'll just, we'll just weather this storm and it'll let's, you know, the whole get back to normal thing. I'm like, that's the wrong question. When are we going to get back to normal? It's the wrong question. It actually doesn't matter. We've had a pretty good, I, I mean, I've said this before, the, my generation, <clears throat> so let's say my generation is every person alive on the planet right now. I know that's tweaking your, your version of generation. Have had a pretty safe in the Western world, for sure. War hasn't been super rampant in the earth. It's been relatively safe, relatively um, peaceful and advanced. We've been advancing and it's been comfortable. 
We have not had super like big tension. All of those that went through World War II, re- like very few of those are alive today. Those who actually lived and were on the planet when that happened. And so we go, okay, Lord, where, where is our battle? Where is our struggle? And what does it look like? <clears throat> what is the answer as a believer? Matthew 20. Jesus says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as a son of man did not come to serve, but to but did not did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is like, look at me, I'm your example. Well, he said, take up your cross daily and follow me. It's like, well, do we get saved every day? No. But do we engage with the salvation repentant? submissive posture on a daily basis that says, God, I need you today. I'm a weak and broken person this morning. It's like, Jesus, you need to come. Holy Spirit, come and fill us, right? The question I had in worship is he said to me, in order to, I I need to displace something if I come in. What are you willing to give up in return? What will you give up to see the Spirit of God move in your, not in your church? Who cares about your church? Who cares about your community right now? We're going to be super, super selfish. You know what your problem is? Is you're not selfish enough. You need to be more selfish. Uh, um, C.S. Lewis via John Piper says that we have not fulfilled our desires enough. Because if we had fulfilled them enough, we would have gone to the depths of their emptiness and found there is nothing there. (sighs) C.S. Lewis is a... Try and read one of his books. (sighs) Yeah. We need to desire him so much that we will say, you can have... We sang it this morning. Dangerous song. You can have all this world. Everything that I have. Just give me Jesus. And his question for us this morning is, what are you going to displace? He's a gentleman. He's not going to come in and make you give things up. He's going to say, what will you give me so that we can be one, so that we can be closer, so that more of my presence can be in you? Galatians 5, 19, which Dana already kind of quoted this morning. <clears throat> the acts of the flesh are obvious, and it has this list of obvious acts of flesh. The end of verse 21 says, I warn you, as I did before, that those who, who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. If we have those obvious acts of the flesh in our life, We do not have eternal life. (sighs) Are they all up there? Yeah. Can you bring up both those verses? Is that possible? 19, 20, and 21. Only one at a time. That's fine. Go to 19. We'll start there. Immorality, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery. We could go and break this down. I've done it before. Verse 20, <clears throat> idolatry, witchcraft. Well, I don't. Sexual immorality. I don't have that. I, hatred. Let's just pause there for a second. Sexual immorality. I'm going to go back to that for a second. Well, I don't operate in that. What are the things that you're consuming via your television? And what is your spirit partnering with your eye gate to consume? Lusts of the flesh. Jealousy, fits of rage. It's all there too. It's like, I saw some fits of rage yesterday. (laughs) I even might have got worked up a little bit. 
selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, factions, factions. Where do you stand with all of this COVID stuff? What faction are you a part of? Our world is so easy. It's interesting. Like <clears throat> political climate, the cold war brought on this like resistance in Western culture to, which is all, most of that's before most of us were born. Some of you might, maybe not. Um, <clears throat> but it like this resistance to uh, communism, but Russia Right. And so over the years, though, that's all softened. Right. And all of a sudden now, because of this conflict in Ukraine, now people are booing a Russian hockey player. The irony, I watched the game the, a couple nights ago when Edmonton was playing Washington. I don't know if you know who. One of the most prolific, prolific scorers in my time. Alexander Ovechkin, phenomenal. He's Russian. And he's about to eclipse Gordie Howe in goals scored in their career. Whenever he got the puck, as I was watching, there was like this chant. And I thought they were saying, O-V. O-V. Someone else informed me they were booing because he's Russian. I was like, what? What does this hockey player who spent the majority of his life in America, the United States, <laughs> as a hockey player, have anything to do with what's going on halfway around the world. Man, we're fickle people. You know, there's stories now of like Russian businesses being like vandalized and, and it's like, what does that individual have anything to do with what's going on over there? Like it's, it's the irony uh, I better not go there. <laughs> our, our media is not very... Yeah, let's, let's leave it. Verse 22, but the fruits of the Spirit are what? Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, peace, who here has anxiety? <laughs> Worry. It's not a fruit of the spirit. That's a fruit of the flesh. That's a fruit that's not a part of the kingdom of this world. Now, that's not condemnation. Everybody with anxiety is like, <gasps> oh no, more anxiety. <laughs> no, reject that in Jesus' name. It's like, Lord, I need to find peace. So much of that for myself, and I'll just say that from my, my own perspective, is understanding that he's the one in charge and in control. Not me. Most of our anxiety is I can't control. And Holy Spirit's like, yeah, I know. It's supposed to be that way. Yeah. You're not supposed to be in control. It's not about you. Oof. Man, we could go down that rabbit hole. Why do we worry? Because we're narcissistic controlling weirdos. <laughs> That if it's not going our way, we get upset. We're a little toddler having a temper tantrum. Carter, I want to go on the stage. <laughs> Mom grabs him, I want to go on the stage. I want to do what I want to do. And what is a parent's job for a kid? To discipline that out. <laughs> to slap. <laughs> Enough. <laughs> But what is, what is, a, what are you, as a parent, what do you do? You discipline, you bring correction, you admonish. Why? So that child doesn't grow up with that nature taking root in their life. Most of us, partly because I think we've had it so good in our lives, when a little bit of trouble comes, we get worried. We can't find peace. It's like Jesus if all of this falls right apart, I think about like worst case scenario. Someone falsely accuses you of something. You lose everything, your family, your life, your reputation, everything. And you're sitting in a cell for the rest of your life. 
going, but I've got you, Jesus. That's what we sang. Take it all. It's not about my reputation. It's not about my comfort. You can take it all away. Gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. 24. Those who belong to Christ have have, uh, crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Where is our authority? Gentleness. Kindness. Had a tough conversation with someone yesterday. <sighs> you know you re- when you replay a tough conversation in your head for the next week? You're like, oh, I've, and, and I, I don't know whether it's good or bad, but I do, I do um, two variants. There's what I did say, and the other variant is what I would like to say. Just, and then the other variant is what I probably should have said. That might have been better than what I did. Does that make sense? It's like, what did I do? Okay, some of that, I should have said. Okay, this is, what, this is what would have been better. The other one's like, no consequences, I'm going to say whatever I feel. Yeah. And it's like, Lord, where are you in that? Where is... Where is your authority in a difficult conversation and difficult relationship? Gentleness, meekness, humility. Jesus, he's like, I'm going to show you disciples what it means, what my authority means. And what does he do? He strips down to his undergarment and he washes their feet. He gets his hands dirty. Now all your feet have all... Hopefully most of you showered this morning. They're all clean in socks and shoes. In that day, the only foot covering they had was sandals. Right? So you're like, okay, well, sandals, you know, they're dirty. No, not just dirty. They lived very close alongside their animals. Walking down roads. Have you ever followed a horse for any length of time? <laughs> you pick up where I'm going. Their feet being dirty was different than your feet being dirty. Your feet being dirty is out in the dirt and dirt got on your shoes and some of it got through your socks and is now on your feet. Or you went to the beach, wore some sandals. Oh, my feet are so dirty. This is not the same dirty. This was the lowest job. Never in that culture would the leader, the teacher, the master of the house ever wash someone's feet. And Jesus goes low. He goes humble and says, I'm going to wash your feet. I'm going to do the the dirty, difficult thing. Why? There's authority in it. What does it look like for your life to have the fragrance of God emanating out of you? The presence, the fragrance As you walk into a room, the atmosphere changes because you're so close with him. You've got so much peace and humility. Chaos can be breaking out and it never never gets on you. It changes the dynamic of the room. I want to end with this and all of this driving to uh, to this scripture. Colossians 1 verse 24 to 27. Paul is talking about his authority, beginning of Colossians 1, and talking about his suffering and his qualifications. He says, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard, in, in regard to Christ's afflictions. So what is he doing? He's like, my physical body, my comfort, affliction. That's what it's going to get. It's going to get suffering. It's going to get... That's, that's, and that's fine. For the sake of his body. Why? The, the, this is the church. Verse 25. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me <clears throat> to present to you the word of God in its fullness, 
What is the word of God? Here, you got to listen up. This is Paul's revelation of God. He's telling the, the, the Colossians here, the, the, this church, <clears throat> this group of believers, he's like, this is it. This is what God has revealed to me. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles, right? So what are Gentiles? They're non-Jewish people, those who don't know the Lord, the glorious riches of his, of his mystery, which is what? Christ in you. This is the glory of God. This is the glory. God moving in our community is this one thing, and we started with it, and we're going to end with it. Jesus manifest in your life. In you. Your authority in meekness and gentleness from the Father is Jesus on you. If we could get a revelation that he is with us everywhere we go. I think sometimes we fall short of that realization. The only hope for our world, there's only one thing. Jesus in you, you, not, man, this is a great message for my spouse or my kids or my friend or whatever. No, Jesus in you. Guys, we've got to stop. We've got to personalize this. I talked about being selfish. Be selfish in the kingdom of God. And that means this, Jesus, I need it all. I need every bit that you have for me. And I cannot stop until I have it all. Christ in you. We know this list in Galatians is impossible. Who here <clears throat> is always love, always joyful, right? I think most of our joyful is fake. It's pretentious. Stupid, happy people. It's not even real. <laughs> Hatred. <laughs> <laughs> peace, perfect peace. This low posture, this humility. And I'm telling you, it works out in the practical world. You've all worked for people, with people, maybe led other people. The best leaders that you have ever experienced do one thing. I guarantee it. They're humble. Who's a difficult person to work with? Someone who thinks they know everything. The humble leader, right? It said, I think Simon Sinek said this, he's like, always be the one asking questions. How do you do that? How does that work? If you, know, if you were doing, what would you do? Be that person that's humble. I mean, that's just one principle. That's not even Jesus' spirit alive inside of you manifesting in the spiritual realm. Tearing down strongholds. <laughs> that's just one principle of humility. It says, I'm going to go to the low place. As a leader, I'm even going to go to the low place. Christ in you, the fragrance of God resting on your life. What fragrance rests on your life today? What is the fragrance of our world that's around us? Factions, quarreling, debauchery. Saw some debauchery yesterday, hey Leo. <laughs> and its fruit played out. It always plays out. But the power of God for you today is Christ in you. Him resting on you. It's a hard thing I've been challenged. It's like trying to spend time with the Lord 
without anything else going on. And that's hard for me. It's hard to sit and do nothing. And I'm learning. God's challenging me to rest. What does rest look like? You know, he gave me a message, labor to enter into my rest. That's contradictory. (laughs) But what does it look like just to sit in his presence? And it doesn't have to be a church. Here's the the, the amazing thing is this. Yes, God's presence was powerful here this morning. He's not limited to a building. It's not about a building. It's a great building. Love this place. Special. It is special. But how much more special are you? Holy Spirit doesn't dwell in this building when we leave. It's just a building. Had someone come in one time and they, a little rough, they swore. (gasps) They literally did that. (laughs) <laughs> not you, Lindy, someone else. <clears throat> and I was like, it's just a building. There ain't no lightning bolts coming down. In the presence of God is where, th- where reverence needs to be. And I want to chal- I want to declare this, prophetically declare this. You have God's presence resting on your frame. Good word. He's resting on you this morning. And it doesn't matter when we sit here and eat pizza and talk about technical stuff about the church in a few hour, in an hour or whatever. It doesn't matter. His presence is resting on your frame. Guys, this is the hope. There's only one hope. There's only one solution. The authority that God has put in you is his spirit alive in you. Resting on you. Let's stand. Holy Spirit, right now, we just acknowledge and thank you for what you've already done this morning. And Lord, help us, challenge us with this thought of displacement where in order for you to fill, something else must come out. So Father, as we read in Galatians about the fruits of the world, Lord, right now we prophetically hold out our hands and we displace some things that we know are in us. We, we take them out so that you can come and fill those areas. Anger, factions, hatred, immorality. Lord, we give them to you. Debauchery, jealousy. Lord, we give them to you. We turn it over to you. Spirit, come and fill us. Fill us. Mm. that peace and love, true joy would flood our lives. That wherever we go and whoever we interact with, there'd be a fragrance of your presence that goes with us. Mm. The fragrance of heaven, Lord. We need the fragrance of heaven. Hmm. Amen. Amen. I pray. My prayer is that you stink like heaven today. (laughs) Yeah.
Yeah. Amen.